this evening. Jesus, we lift you up. Thank you for that great hope that we have in you. A wonderful life here invested in your kingdom, but heaven to come. Ah, I like that. Look into the future. Just this evening, Dad, I was asking Mom and Dad for prayer for a situation tomorrow with my work and my dad after agreeing, they all agreeing together in prayer about it. He said, you know what, tomorrow afternoon that will all be behind you. And if you're going through a rough spot in your life right now, you know what you have to look forward to. I'm going to fly away. i got a home in glory. Thank you guys for these hymns. Thank you, Mom, for participating this evening. Everything worked out. I'm sure your Facebook and social media is blowing up with our youth at the uh, North American Youth Conference. They're having a wonderful time. It hadn't even started. I saw Brother Dillingham posting. Service is going to start in an hour and a half, and he panned around, and there's... It was tens of thousands of people who was already gathered there at that time. In the spirit of excitement, I ask you to pray this evening. God, anoint them, bless every one of them, give every bit of blessing they can. And it just to flow in this sanctuary the exact same way. But the Charlesville is asking for prayer for his lip. We've been praying for that. He had the biopsy today, so he'll hear results soon. Asking the Lord to do a miracle healing there. And then pray for the Rosiak and the Carter family with the loss of, of John Rosiak. God be with them comfort. We'll announce the services at the intermission. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as the ushers come to receive the tithe and offering. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this time of excitement with the youth conference, with many of our people being there and involved. I ask the anointing of the Holy Ghost to move in a beautiful way. Help everyone to return reunited, filled full of the anointing of the Holy Ghost fire. Help that to spread across this nation, across our world. I ask ask your blessings to be in the sanctuary this evening. Bless your word as it comes forth, our fellowship. God, we ask you to speak healing into Brother Charles Veal's body. Ask you to give comfort and rest and peace to the Rosiac and to the Carter family. Ask your anointing upon this tithe and offering. Ask your blessings upon the remainder of the service and our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thankful for the blood of Jesus this evening. Jesus, thank you for the blood that you shed for us. Thank you for the sacrifice you made so that we could have life and have life more abundantly. Uh, glad to be a part of the body of Christ. We're going to fellowship in just a moment. I did want to give you the service specifics for John Rosiak. It's going to be at Rimmert's Funeral Home in East Peoria. Visitation Friday from 5 to 7 p.m. And then Saturday the funeral services will also be there at 10 a.m. As we was preparing, I mentioned the NYAC um, youth conference that's end up going on. There's, they said there's 34,000 people who are registered to end up being there tonight. My son was telling me there's 70,000 seats in that auditorium. They had to expand it because they couldn't fit everybody this year into the last year's facilities. He said there's, I think it's the seventh largest stadium in the United States at this point. Boy, he was talking. He's all evangelistic minded about what's going to end up happening. So as they was posting all their pictures, I just want you all to know, our worship team took their own picture up here of us preparing for service. <laughs> they think they have something on us. Wait till they hear about this service tonight, what ended up happening. And just, I just wanted to end up sharing a beautiful memory I have as my mom was end up playing there. How many of you remember how the old sanctuary used to be set up? The red carpets down here, and then there was wooden railings that you would kneel at. And many times, just loving being a part of the body of Christ is all the only part of the story that relates to the rest of you all. The rest was just my beautiful memories of a big Leslie over there, my mom playing that organ. And I would just lean my ear up against it. And it wouldn't even, I don't even think she was playing, and it would still be whirling. Is that right? And now, it whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> and we was at camp for family camp, and I was looking out, and I told my wife, I think I hear a Leslie. And she said, it is. That guy, you couldn't see it very well. I have just good memories. Dad playing the bass. Brother Bill Merricks. I remember Brother John Lashley and I kneeling down here like we was praying, Bishop. But really, we was peeking over the railing, watching the drummer going to work on those gold sparkle drums. <laughs> I love being a part of the body of Christ. Take a few minutes. Fellowship with one another. We're going to have a wonderful service in Jesus' name.
Well, praise God, everybody. Praise the Lord. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord. It seems like, for me, it's been hit and miss with everything going on since vacation. But uh, it is good to be here. Uh, just uh, quickly, uh, Brother Wally Smith has lost a key fob. It's a Ford key fob. It's got a couple little keys on it. So if you see it laying around, would you, or you find your children chewing on it or something, would you please get it back to Brother Wally Smith? Amen. Praise God. Um, I covet your prayers uh, in the uh, days ahead. I've been was this past weekend with Brother Shelton, the passing of his father. And uh, funerals are such a trying time. Whether we are expecting them or not, the heart, the Bible says, love never fails. The heart never knows when to say, okay, enough's enough. We just keep on hoping against hope. And um, so I ask that you would remember them in prayer. Also, I'm sure most of you know, if not every one of you know, that um, John Rosiak passed away this past weekend as well. And um, we're going to be officiating that funeral this weekend, which um, I count as an honor and at the same time a surprise. Uh, you just never know what impact the church has on people. And while this may not have been John and Brenda's home church, um, obviously the church had a place of impact in their life, and they've asked me to officiate that service. So I would ask that you would pray, God, give me wisdom, direction, and um, most people come to Christ out of crisis, and only God knows what would happen in this situation. Also, remember our young people and several of our staff, obviously, it's slim pickings a little bit tonight, all of our young people, college and careers, and all the staff that goes with that is in Indianapolis tonight. Uh, for our North American Youth Congress and pray that God would give them some high water marks to look back on in their life. Um, it's just, it's amazing what happens in atmospheres like this with young people where they're surrounded with thousands upon thousands of thousands of like-minded young people and they don't feel like they're the only ones in the world. And uh, so pray for them that God would impart into them something that they would carry for the rest of their life. I want to talk to you tonight on a subject uh, following on uh, the heels of Brother Grant's uh, message and mine of last Wednesday um, on a subject that most often I feel inadequate when I step in the pulpit. I'll just be quite honest with you. How can you convey the mind of God through human means? And um, tonight I want to talk to you. I'm not going to get done by any means. Uh, but I want to talk to you on the apostolic burden. The apostolic burden. It is the most important ingredient for apostolic revival and harvest. It is the most important ingredient. Without an apostolic burden, we will never see the apostolic results that the first church saw. And we desperately need, it, need them today. In the, back in the days of the early church, uh, 1,000 was added, 3,000 was added, and many times we read where multitudes were added to the church. In today's society, we desperately need that kind of revival. Jesus is coming back, and we are living in a lost and dying world. And it's not good enough that we have one or two receive the Holy Ghost here and there, or even one or two a week. I believe it's the desire of God that multiple, that multitudes come to the saving knowledge of our Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is impossible since we are his hands and his feet. The only way that's possible is for you and I to catch the burden of the Lord Jesus. That's what we are in need of and, and we desire in this 21st century. Trying to attain apostolic results without an apostolic burden is like trying to make an apple pie without the apples. 
It's impossible. You and I know it. In fact, without apostolic burden, it's impossible to maintain an apostolic attitude that Brother Grant talked about a couple weeks ago. It's impossible to develop apostolic leadership without an apostolic burden. It's impossible, as I taught last week, to implement an apostolic change in our life. Not to devalue any of these because they're all important. You can't have apple pie without the other ingredients as well. But apostolic burden is the main component of apostolic results. Many years ago, Dr. David Gibbs, he's a pastor and an attorney for the Christian Law Association. He preached a message and entitled it, Preference or Conviction? Preference or conviction. You see, there is a difference. Preference is something that you prefer. I have a lot of preferences in life. And when given an opportunity, I would like to choose those preferences. But it's not going to change my life if I don't get it. It sure would be nice to have. Now understand that we're talking about apostolic burden in the church not apostolic doctrine, not new birth salvation. We're talking about apostolic burden here. It's necessary to be saved to have apostolic doctrine and salvation. But it's necessary to grow a church and for others to be reached for you and I to have an apostolic burden. So a preference is something I would like to have. And Brother Duhon, I would like to have a burden of Christ. I pray that the burden of the Lord be upon me, especially every time I step into a pulpit. But how many times when I wake up in the morning facing Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that I pray, God, let your burden be upon me today. I don't know who I'm going to meet, and I guarantee you I'm going to change a life greater in the world in which I walk than in a church in which I preach. Because we tend to change lives one-on-one. So a preference is something that I would choose, but a conviction is a principle that I live by and if need be die by. It's a strong persuasion or a belief, something that I'm willing to suffer for, or even in the pain of death. You see, the early church attained salvation, and they could have hid, Brother Lashley, with their salvation in the deserts and the catacombs, in which they did, but they didn't stay there. In peril of their own life, they would preach and they would teach and they would minister and they would witness the the greatness of our God and Savior. That was a burden of Christ that was being expressed in the lives of everyday believers, not just the apostles. Sometime back, I couldn't sleep. And so, as I want to do often, I reached over and grabbed a book. Well, this book just how happened to be on my uh, notepad, and it was a Fox's Book of Martyrs. What a mistake. I just thought I couldn't sleep before I read, began reading that. I'd read it, for, uh, I'd read it in school for an uh, essay that I had to do, but, you know, whenever you're in school, you're just skimming through, finding the answers, finding the, re- finding the highlights, and spitting out the information. But this time, I, I, was, I was restless, and I thought, you know what? What more boring piece of literature to put you to sleep than history, right? And I'd rather read the history of the church than the history of the world any day. So I began to read that. And needless to say, sleep did not come to me that night. But tears and agony of spirit as I read of brothers and sisters that would give their life in a moment just for a conviction of this is what's right and this is what you need to do. After tonight's lesson, as you pray and reflect in the coming days, I want you to ask yourself, is an apostolic burden a preference or is it a conviction to me? 
It needs to be both. <laughs> you know, first we have to prefer it before it can be born in us as a conviction. And, and there, it is a process. I want to talk to you first about the need for an apostolic burden. We must have an apostolic burden in order to fulfill our calling. How many of you realize that you do have a calling of ministry? Not just the pastor, every last one of us, every believer has a calling to ministry. And we have to have an apostolic burden in order to fulfill that calling. Here's why. Ministry, brothers and sisters, is too demanding, too heavy just to be a duty of noble service. I know I need to do it. I know it's what's necessary in order for my neighbor to be reached, for Peoria to be reached, and for the Tri-County area to be reached. But for it just to be a, a noble desire or obligation, it's much too heavy, and it's much too consistent of a weight. It must be born out of an apostolic burden. It's the heartbeat of God. It is the very heartbeat of God himself born into the heart of a believer that compels you and I to empty out ourself for his service. What is an apostolic burden? Where does it come from? How do I know if I have one? And finally, how do I acquire it? I hope to answer these questions in the next few studies. An apostolic burden, simply put, is this. It's the burden of the Lord Jesus. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if you think he didn't know the cost before he got here, we are not reading adequately the scriptures. The Bible says he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He knew what was in store for him before he ever came to earth. And yet his burden for you and I, his love for you and I compelled him to lay down his life for us. That is the burden of Christ. And that is the same burden, brothers and sisters, that we as the church must pick up in order to reach our world. Remember that we are laborers together with the Lord Jesus. And he ascended back into heaven. But when he ascended into heaven, Brother Kenny, he gave you and I this ministry of reconciliation. Reconciling the world unto God. He left that, Sister Tanya, and you're in my hands. How can I attain this ministry? How can I enter in, much less fulfill the will and the calling of God on my life if I don't have his burden? You and I must have this burden of Jesus. It comes out of a close and a personal, loving, consistent, continual relationship with him. You can't stay around somebody very long without finding out what's important to, to them. And if you love them a lot, it, it just naturally becomes important to you. The more I spend time I spend with the Lord Jesus, the more I get close to him, not just sending up my request and asking for my benefits and my needs, but the more I delve into the will and the call of God on my life, the more I see my world lost and the more I reach for my calling, the closer I get to his heart beat and the more his thoughts become my thoughts and the more his desires become my desires and I can't look at my neighbors the same anymore I can't let the guy just walk past me on the street without wondering how do I reach this one I can't work beside the man or the woman and just let them go daily in their troubles without something burning on the inside of me that says how do I get in their world It's the burden of Christ. Some make the mistake of confusing apostolic burden with human compassion. There is a difference. Mothers, for instance, naturally have this nurturing instinct, and it tends to make them naturally more compassionate. The key word there is natural. There's nothing natural, Brother Grant, about loving your enemies. There's nothing natural about laying down your life for somebody that is just a, a common person, an acquaintance. There's nothing natural, brothers and sisters, uh, Brother Brad, about the burden of the Lord. There's nothing natural about it. It is supernatural. And thus it is supernaturally born in you and I. It's not taught. It's not learned. It's birthed. 
I can talk to you about it. I can show you in Scripture where it, it, it's, it's, it's com- we are compelled to receive it. I can exemplify it before you, but I can't give it to you. Neither will God give it to you until we open up our spirit and allow it to be born in us. It's something that we have to desire. Before something can be born, a seed must be planted. How many of you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost in this room today? If you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, then I've got good news for you. The seed's been planted. The seed's been planted. If you have the Holy Ghost, then you have the potential for apostolic burden. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 and 6, stir up the gift that is within you. Do you know the burden of the Lord is a gift? It's a driving factor that will force you to pray. It's a driving factor that will cause you to push back from the table. It's a force on the inside of you that will compel you to do more than just come to church. It will compel you to do the will of God in your life. And Paul's telling Timothy, he said, stir up that gift that is within you. Don't let it lay dormant. Activate the seed of apostolic burden and passion through prayer. You see, it's God's desire to see his passion and his heartbeat in his people. I remember my father talking to me when I was just a young man. Maybe in high school, thinking about future, which way from here. I remember him saying this. He said, son, I don't care if you're a ditch digger. Just be a good one. And make my God your God. You ever remember that statement, Jonathan? Make my God your God. Your God. It's the desire of every parent to pass on this hunger, this desire, this passion, as it is our Heavenly Father's. Brothers and sisters, it's necessary for the promised revival that we have here at POP for you and I to grab a hold and allow this apostolic burden to be birthed within us. Matthew chapter 9 verse 36. When Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, when Jesus saw the multitudes, oh yeah, by the way, our staff's gone. That's why it's important to bring your Bible to church. I got one here and one in my pocky. Matthew 9 36. But when he saw the multitudes, Jesus He was moved with compassion on them. I want you to get that. He didn't just have compassion. He was moved. He was moved. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, he was moved. And look back at him and say, that means he did something. I'm telling you, an apostolic burden will cause you to move into action. It won't cause you just to grieve. It won't cause you just to feel bad. It won't cause you just to wonder. It'll cause you to pray. It'll cause you to fast. It'll cause you to reach out. When he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they fainted and were scattered abroad. And here's what Jesus saw them as. He didn't see them as an inconvenience. He didn't see them as a problem. He didn't see them as an obstacle to his purpose or his agenda. The Bible says he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And the heart of God was the heart of a shepherd. How many times have you ever heard him referred to as the good shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. What was he doing? He was telling us 
Sheep were his desire, we are, we are his heartbeat. We are referred in the scripture many times as sheep. And Jesus saw the multitudes that were without, the multitudes that maybe later on would stone him or, or, or take up stones to stone him, the multitudes that would cry crucify him. Those same multitudes, he said, I don't see them as enemies. I don't see them as sinners. I don't see them as hypocrites, which some of them were. The Bible said he saw them as sheep. Having no shepherd. Over and over, Scripture records it. Jesus was moved with compassion. Why? Because that was his burden. It wouldn't leave him alone. If you and I really want to know how Jesus feels about the lost, we don't need to look any further than the Garden of Gethsemane. Where he cried out, Father, if it be possible, this is not my idea. This is not my preference. If it be possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, there's something on the inside of me that if there's no other way to reach this world, if there's no other way to reconcile God to man, then not my will. How many times do we go out and we have our agenda? We have, how many of you, is, not days are planned, how many of you is weeks are planned? Months. Weeks in advance, we, we jam our schedules full. We're a busy people. You think God wasn't busy? You think he didn't have an agenda? Time and time again, we find himself being stopped on his way. Yet he would say, not my will, thine be done. That's where God chose the pain. He didn't just allow it to happen. He said, I could, at this moment, he said, I could just say the word. And my father would send 10,000 legions, legions of angels and deliver me. This is where he chose the pain of the, whipping, of the whipping post and the cross. This place of Gethsemane is where he chose to be rejected, where he chose the shame, where he chose the embarrassment, where he chose to redeem the lost, you and I included. It was there that he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. He endured the pain at the present for the joy of eternity. As a, as a believer, as a born-again believer, you and I are going to have to get a mindset that I can put up with inconvenience and even pain in this time right now just to see another soul born into the kingdom, just to see another life transformed, just to see another family put back together, just to see somebody else come to this saving knowledge. You see, a burden is not relieved or satisfied because we have an outreach program or a vacation Bible school. Thank God for all of those. But that doesn't relieve my burden. The organized evangelism methods doesn't relieve the burden. This burden burns in us day and night. It becomes a part of us until we are transformed by it. Listen to the prophet Jeremiah as he bears his burden before the Lord. In Jeremiah 20 and 7. Eight. Oh Lord, you deceived me. I felt that way a time or two. You see, any of you that know my personality know that pastoring is not it. I am a loner. People, crowds, wear me out I stutter I'm just not cut out for this but brother Duham when I came to God I said God I don't know what you can do with this but whatever I'm yours and whatever you can do with this piece of clay and do it. Oh, I had visions of helping Bishop 
and maybe the next pastor that come along. I'm telling you what, if God ever takes me out of the pulpit, I'll be the best saint that ever lived. If you would have told me when I was 23 years old that this would be the course of my life, I'd be lost for the last 27 of them probably. God tricked me. God tricked me. Jeremiah said, God, you deceived me and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. I'm here. Jeremiah, he thought that being a prophet of God was going to bring him some esteem, huh? I'm ridiculed all day. Everybody mocks me. When I speak, when I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction, so the word have brought me insult and reproach all day long. Verse 9, the King James Version reads this way. Then I said, I won't make mention of him nor speak any more about his name. I can't tell you how many times I retired on Sunday afternoon walking out of the pulpit. Resign. I'm, I'm going back to twisting wire nuts, bending pipe. I won't speak anymore in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire that was shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. The English version said, I tried my best to hold it in, but I can no longer keep it back. That's the burden of the Lord. Here Jeremiah is torn between his loyalty to God and his deep love for these people. Israel was a family that was set apart. It was different from the rest of the world. He loved them. Yet he was isolated because of the word of God. He said, God, you tricked me. But if I try to keep quiet, it comes bursting out of my heart. Jeremiah 8 and 20 and 22 it speaks to the heart. It speaks to the reason why this man of God struggled so. The harvest is past. The summer's ended. And we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I'm black. Astonishment has taken hold on me. There's no, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Can you hear the heartbeat of this man? He's connected with God. When was the last time you drove down the streets of your neighborhood, of, of your, uh, at your, your place of, of business? When was the last time you walked down the halls at work and you looked around and you knew that one was having marital problems and you knew that one had an addiction and you knew that one over there was having trouble with their children and you knew that one over there was in fin financial distress and you knew the vast majority of them were lost and something tugged on the inside of you and you wonder, God, how do I reach these people? Isaiah, he's been cleansed, receives a vision from the Lord. God says, who will I send? He says, I will go, send me. And we find this old man of God steps up to the podium and begins to preach the word of the Lord, even though it finds him a place in a hollow log being sawn asunder. Why? I can't get away from this burden. With a true apostolic burden, brothers and sisters, there is no reservation, there's nothing that costs too much. There's nothing that takes too much time. There is no hesitation. Let's look at the burden of the early church. Paul was consenting to Stephen's death in Acts chapter 1 and verse, uh, through verse 4. And at that time there was great, everyone say great. Great persecution. Not economic decline. Not... What is it, the uh, not interest rate climb? Great persecution against 
the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered. That doesn't mean that they left of their own accord. Sister Ray, that means that families were dispersed everywhere. They were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Everyone except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Saul made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. This next verse blows your mind. So they all went underground. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. (laughs) I'm telling you what, you can't kill a burden. You can't intimidate a burden. You can't stomp a burden out. Come on, one of their leaders, Stephen, was murdered for preaching Jesus. Men and women were hauled to prison, forced out of their homes, scattered all over the known world. Did that stop the New Testament church? Did this quench the apostolic burden of the New Testament church? Not even the pain of death because of a burden. It goes beyond duty and obligation. It goes beyond convenience and leaving life, much less our organized programs. An apostolic burden knows absolutely no limits and it will not stop until it succeeds yeah, they, they just don't want Jesus somebody does somebody does a burden is a catalyst to faith how many of you want more faith you can get a greater burden A burden is a catalyst to faith. It'll cause you to do things that are impossible and watch it succeed. Catalyst is an agent that provokes or speeds significant change or action. When you really believe something, I mean you really believe something, The greater the resistance simply mandates a greater effort. Come on. Any any sports nuts out there? Any of you guys that are uh, maybe you knew you could do something, yet it, it just, it wouldn't happen and it wouldn't happen and it wouldn't happen and it wouldn't happen, but you knew, come on, I know I can do this. So did you just quit? Did you whine and say, well, I guess I really can't? No. You push a little bit harder until finally you achieve what you're, what you're endeavoring to do. When you really believe something, do you really believe that God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh? Do you really believe that in the last days there's going to be incredible revival? Do you really believe that there is an outpouring of the Holy Ghost just ready to be exploding in this this area of Peoria, East Peoria, Morton, Pekin? Come on. Do you really believe that or is that just a preference? Do you really believe, come on, if you and I really believe that, we'll push a little bit harder. We'll pray a little bit longer. We'll fast a little bit more. We'll give a little bit more effort. Whenever it it mandates a, a little more effort, you don't tone it down. You turn it up because faith only sees victory, even in the face of Goliath. So in Acts chapter 8 and 4, therefore... It means because of the persecution, they were scattered everywhere. Not just in Jerusalem, everywhere. And they preached the word. They preached the word. Every one of us know someone that's struggling in life. Every last one of us 
in this day and age that we live in, come on, maybe 50 years ago, I would say in the moral climate of maybe the 50s and the 60s, man, I'm getting old. 50 years do not even bring us back to the 50s or the 60s for that matter. <laughs> Brother Brad, before our time, the moral climate of America, you may live in such a secluded circle of people that there was nobody that obviously had major issues other than being lost. But you and I know in today's society someone that's hurting, that's struggling, that needs God, that needs an answer. Does it mean that they preached doctrine everywhere they went? They were new people. They invited somebody over for dinner and started being neighborly and found out that so and so's child was taken in a raid by the Syrians and that mother and father's really hurting. So they began to talk about the peace. Now I'm just. For instance here, okay, I'm not Bible here, but the Assyrians, the Romans, they, they were all always raiding and stealing family members. And they began to talk about, you know, maybe the Romans did come and take this or that. But you know what? There is a peace that passes all understanding. I can't tell you how many times I use this in funerals when I'm talking to people whose lives have been completely ripped apart and there's no reason why they should feel peace. He's the peace that passes all human understanding. There's no reason you should feel peace right now, but I'm going to pray for you and you're going to feel the presence of God and God's going to help you. I'm sure that's how the church began to grow in Rome, in Galatia, in Ephesus, in Philippi. Oh, yeah, they had church. They had great church. But conversions were done mostly on a one-on-one -on -one basis. A real burden overpowers persecution, and it supersedes any fear. Jesus, when he would talk about his love for Israel, he likened it to a mother's love. Do you have any first responders? You, I know Brother Duhan used to be a first responder. Brother Kenny. How difficult is it to keep a mom from running back into a burning house after her children? There's no way that 110-pound woman should have that kind of strength or ability, or tenacity to defy you. Yet, I would venture to say that you would be hard-pressed to keep her by yourself from running into that house. Brother Kenny, how often do you see a mother going back into a car when there's a possibility for explosion, there's a possibility? It doesn't matter. Why? It's the love of this mother for a child. Let me tell you, the love of God for humanity supersedes the love of a mother for a child. And he has put that love in our heart by the Holy Ghost, the Scripture says. A real burden that's in touch with that love will supersede any fear of rejection. In Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is literally running for his life. In Thessalonica, he had great revival. Many of the Greeks had received the Holy Ghost and were coming to truth. And then some Jews came down. And they were trying to kill the Apostle Paul. So he goes to Berea. And my God, he's having an incredible revival there. And guess what? More of them show up and run him out of Berea. So while Paul waited on them, at Athens, uh, Silas and Timothy, he had to flee to Athens. Most of us would say, you know what? I'm just going to take a breather here. 
I've made it out of two cities by the skin of my teeth. I'm waiting on reinforcements. Silas and Timothy are coming. When, when, when three, uh, everybody knows that a threefold cord is not easily broken. Man, we could rationalize it all the way, couldn't we? But yet Paul waited on him at Athens, and his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city whole and given to idolatry. And we find him standing up saying, my God. He said, I, I know you have a lot of gods here. Let me tell you about my God. This statue that you have to the unknown God, let me tell you about him. You see, it's not enough to love righteousness. I love righteousness. There's, there's such a peace that comes with righteousness. How, how many of you, especially you parents, you've, you know this. When things are right at home, there's such a peace. I want them little twerps bust ignorant. There's all kinds of chaos in the home. I love righteousness. But it's not enough to love righteousness. Because you can't just coexist and tolerate evil and still have righteousness. I don't have time to do any parenting classes today, but let me tell you, parents, you don't get anywhere by turning a blind eye to what's going on in the home. But back to the burden of the Lord. When something, something ought to move in the heart of every true child of God when we look around and see the evil in our society. Now, I'm not saying we need to go on campaigns and marches. and You see, a righteous hatred for sin and evil needs to rise up in us, causing us to intercede. A burden is not expressed by contending. Paul got in more trouble trying to contend for the truth. I believe with all my heart, Bishop, that's why God took him out of Jerusalem and away from the Jews. He was too smart. How often do we hear of him contending in the temple? And God said, you know what, let me take you out of your comfort zone. I'll give you to a bunch of heathens that don't know a thing in the world about God. Moses, the laws of Moses. So you can't stand on your knowledge and you have to rely upon the anointing. And where did Paul have his greatest victories and his greatest influence was among, oh, the people that he contended with. No, among those that he interceded for. It would cause us to intercede on the behalf of sinners Binding ungodliness in our city. Do you know you have a power within you? The burden of the Lord ought to get a hold of us and cause us to begin to bind the powers that would hinder and harm revival and the people that we work with and loose them to see the glorious gospel. The burden of the Lord will cause us to intercede, to loose the love of God and deliverance from the bondages of sin. Psalms 45, 7 in the Old Testament and Hebrews 1 and 9 in the New Testament says, Because thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness, therefore God, thy God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above all thy fellows. Brothers and sisters, there is absolutely no substitute for a burden. Just stand. The wonderful thing of it is we have this heavenly treasure in earthen vessels. We have the opportunity as humanity to connect with the Almighty and allow a divine work to be done through you and I. 
The enemy will do everything he possibly can to distract us from the burden of the Lord through convenience and pleasure. Don't allow it. Don't throw away the eternal for the temporal. I can't take anything from this earth to heaven with me, Brother Ray, except the souls that I disciple. How hard do we work for things in this world? And Brother Duhan, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's not going to mean a thing. I was laying in bed some night ago. My chest was killing me. It's probably for the pizza that I ate. I laid there and grabbed my chest. And the thought crossed my mind. If I never wake in the morning. No, that's a country song. The thought crossed my mind that if I don't wake up tomorrow and I meet God face to face, How am I going to give an account for the last night of all the virtue that he's given me to spend? Where have I spent it? I don't mind telling you that I was taken back a little bit. And that's where these studies were born out. We're in the middle of talking about holiness. We're going to get back to it. But we have got to get an apostolic vision. I remember these studies from P.I. Brother Lashley brought them up. Brother Grant talked about them. This is the foundation of who we are. And it don't matter what we do if we don't have the right ambition the right heart. And it's all founded in a burden. Got to have the burden. God, if you would have allowed me in my humanity, I would have consumed life upon my selfish person. And I would have been miserable and lost. But Lord, in your infinite grace, you allowed me to see the small-minded plan of life that I had set before me and allowed me to enter into such a bigger picture, your burden. God, it's a hard thing to grasp because we can't see the end from the beginning. Only you can do that. But God, help us to grasp the wonder of entering into this ministry with you. And give us, oh God, I pray, a burden. Help us to grasp the importance of having a burden to go along with the knowledge of the word. Let the burden of God be birthed within every one of us. Lord, let there become a desire on the inside of us to think the thoughts of God, to desire the things of God, to have your mind set and therefore your heart beat so that we can transform this world. And God, our eternal reward, our eternal consequence of life will be so much greater and the lives of those that are around us can be transformed. And we take with us to heaven the joy, oh God, the joy of the sacrifice that the burden brought on in our life. God, let your will be done in us. We can't do this on our own. We need you. So God, impart your burden into us and 
God, anoint us with your grace. I ask you to go with every individual in this auditorium. As we go our separate ways, God, give us your mind. Let us see with spiritual eyes those that are hurting around us. God, you have much people in the city of Peoria. You have much people everywhere we go, Lord. You have placed us, divinely placed us where we are. Now, God, open our eyes that we can see you at work and work with you. And, Lord, that you may reap the harvest. Grant us boldness. Let the boldness of the Holy Ghost begin to speak through us in order to change those lives. God, anoint your people. Bless us, O oh God, as we go, but anoint us to speak your word. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Vacation Bible School starts next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You're not going to want to end up missing it. But Sister Matheson, would you mind just giving everybody an expectation of what's going to happen next Wednesday? I want you to invite your friends. It's on Facebook. It's on the website just invite your friends we've been praying about god changing people's lives here's an opportunity for you to minister okay so next wednesday is going to be a regular church service so we're hoping that everyone will still be in attendance it's going to be formatted kind of like a children's revival type service so bring your kids even though they're under the age of five they'll still be able to participate that night and you come and support you know we're pushing for the holy ghost we're pushing for